aliens, close encounters, and unidentified flying objects. Since the early days of the silver screen, Hollywood has used the subject of UFOs to entertain us, scare us, and touch our hearts. Yet is the UFO phenomenon more fact than fantasy? Could man already have proof of alien contact? From the beginning and throughout the ages, man has pondered the meaning of his existence. In this vast universe, is man really alone? Journey into the unknown as we examine the extraordinary. Explore the possibilities as we unearth ancient secrets, decipher the mysterious, and endeavor to comprehend the unexplained. Do aliens really exist? I think it has to be something out there. You know, Earth is kind of small in this really big universe. There's gotta be some other things going on out there. Concealed from the public for over 50 years, you'll be amazed as pieces of the alleged Roswell crash debris are revealed for the first time. You'll witness the extraordinary evidence that's been hidden from the world, physical proof of alien contact. This could be the proof that science has been looking for. And you'll be shocked as you witness alien implants being removed from ordinary people. You'll go inside the real X-Files and uncover the test results the government doesn't want you to know. We are definitely dealing with some kind of a non-human intelligence that is interacting with our plant, with our animal, and with our human life on the surface of this planet. In one of the most extraordinary yeah, interviews of our time, okay. former astronaut Gordon Cooper breaks his silence. There were a number of extraterrestrial vehicles out there cruising around. You'll be astonished as this real-life American hero discusses his close encounters with alien craft. Small saucer flew overhead and put down some landing gear and landed out on the dry lake bed only about 50 yards out. And we'll analyze startling new UFO footage. These craft, uh, because of the bright light emitting off them, including the color coming off the bottom, are often referred to as motherships. You'll be astounded as we examine the extraordinary never before seen footage that's being filmed and photographed every day. It's very much undeniable that these are not conventional aircraft and they've been seen all around the world and that should raise some serious questions with most people. In one of the most controversial interviews ever filmed, former government scientist Bob Lazar discusses his scientific work on extraterrestrial craft at the top secret military research facility known as S-4. There's no doubt in my mind these were alien craft. They absolutely were. And is there a government cover-up? NASA has already officially admitted life on other planets exists. The simplest explanation to us is that they are the remains of Martian life. But if an extraterrestrial intelligence is already visiting Earth, how long have they been here? What does the military really know about aliens? There's just no question uh, but that uh, information on this topic has been kept from the public. You'll be at ground zero when close encounters come to life as we examine the extraordinary evidence that suggests we're not alone in the universe. Never before has a single program put this much evidence and footage on trial. If what you are about to see is real, it gives us answers to the greatest question of our time. Are we really alone? John Goodwood is a world-renowned UFO footage expert and television producer. He has devoted much of his life to the study of UFO photographic evidence. Nine times out of ten, you, you will ask the average person, and they just simply want to see something. Uh, hearsay evidence, you know, someone telling you a story, just doesn't hold as much weight as a physical picture of an event. These craft... Uh, because of the bright light emitting off them, including the color coming off the bottom, are often to referred to as uh, beam ships or mother ships because of their size and the, this illumination that's often seen. This particular shot here 
uh, was shot in Sweden. I think what's most unique about it is uh, the very distinctive outline of the craft. Very often you'll see UFO footage that appears as a light in the sky. Uh, this is very common, actually. Um, but this particular craft, you can actually see the color discharge on the bottom, which is uh, very unusual. You can see the craft approaching this hill, and it passes behind the hill, and then rises again a few moments later behind some trees in the distance. It's also very striking to see the craft moving in and out of the tree line. I would say that this footage here is quite rare uh, due to the fact that it's so clear. Again, you can see a lot of detail on the top of the craft, some sort of dome on the top. And again, the, the, the bright illumination is unmistakable. No conventional aircraft is shaped like that that we have now. Some hovercraft and uh, you know, other kind of uh, experimental vehicles, if you will. But we have nothing with this shape that'll fly through the air uh, in this manner. Today, more UFO footage is being filmed than ever before. Thanks to the popularity of the camcorder, unsuspecting cameramen around the world are photographing extraordinary and unexplainable UFO sightings. This was shot from the Rio Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1995. Uh, you can clearly see a pulsating disc as the lightning flashes in the background. A closer look at this particular shot reveals very striking detail. You can almost see portholes in the top and bottom of the craft. Now, this is another craft that was seen in the Gulf Breeze, Florida area. You can see this craft quite clearly flying down the freeway as our cameraman uh, rather dangerously hangs out the window of his car to get the shot. Uh, they followed as long as they could, uh, but uh, could not keep pace with the craft. And pretty soon, uh, with traffic, it made its way out of sight. Sightings like these are filmed around the world every day. Amazingly, this photographic evidence receives little or no media attention and is generally dismissed by the public. Linda Moulton Howe is an Emmy award-winning scientific journalist. Linda is one of the world's foremost authorities on unidentified flying objects. For years, she has traveled the world investigating UFO close encounters and paranormal evidence. Linda helps explain why sightings like these receive little, if any, public attention. How do people who have to get up in the morning, go to work, come home, cook dinner, raise kids, and take care of pets, and get to bed and get up in the morning, how can they possibly see that there might be something else really important that they should be paying attention to? It's kind of around the fringes. They hear about it every now and then. But they put their hands up and say, well, but what relevance is it to me? Unfortunately, there are many societal taboos concerning even discussing it out in the open. I think that needs to change. We need to have a lot more communication discussion with one another about the evidence that exists, and maybe we can get to some conclusive answers. In the late 1950s, America entered the space race. NASA selected seven test pilots to become the first astronauts in history. Major Gordon Cooper was one of the men chosen for the Mercury space program. His historic flight aboard Faith 7 lasted a record 34 hours, and he became the first man in history to orbit the planet 22 times. Three, two, one, zero, liftoff. Astronaut Gordon Cooper returned to Earth as a true American hero. All I can say is that it certainly is a great honor to be invited here and to be presented this award. And thank you all very much. Today, Gordon Cooper looks back at his historic space flight. It's very impressive out there and very awe-inspiring. And when you look out here at this big universe that God has created for us, it makes you feel about that tall. It's very humbler. And, but it's very impressive and, and uh, very awe-inspiring to look back on Earth from space. Before Gordon Cooper entered the space program, 
he had his own encounter with a different type of space travel. While flying over Central Europe, his fighter squadron came upon a formation of UFOs. There were a number of extraterrestrial vehicles out there cruising around, flying the same kind of formation we fly in our fighters. They didn't have wings, they were saucer shaped, and we never could get as high or as fast as they were, so to really positively identify them, but they were metallic looking and saucer in shape, and they could do a few maneuvers that we couldn't do in the airplane like just horizontally displace themselves rapidly. Be flying along and just move over rapidly. Gordon Cooper's UFO sighting wasn't his only close encounter. In 1958, he was working as a project manager at Edwards Air Force Base in California. I had a film crew working for me on a project I was doing to put a precision landing system in on the edge of the dry lake bed and they were filming the various stages of the installation. And a small saucer apparently flew overhead and put down some landing gear and landed out on the dry lake bed, only about 50 yards out. And these were old pro cameramen who were used to flying in all kinds of vehicles to take all kinds of pictures. And so they picked up their cameras and started over toward it. And gonna get some close-ups. And with that, it lifted up, put the gear back in, and at a very high rate of speed, disappeared. So they came in to tell me what happened. I told them to get over to the lab and develop the film immediately. And I would go and look in the book, regulation book, and see what you're supposed to do, who you have to call to report these kind of incidents, and, which I did. And by the time they got back with the film, there was a higher and higher and higher ranked man preceding the last one, assuring me that I had to get those negatives into a pouch and that they had made arrangements already to get our commanding general's airplane reserved and take the films to Washington. In an effort to organize open investigations of UFO sightings, Gordon Cooper wrote a letter to the United Nations in 1976 appealing for assistance. His letter stated, these are extraterrestrial vehicles visiting from other planets. And it was presented to the council and certainly made a lot of people aware of a number of things that uh, perhaps they had not been aware of before, so maybe it opened a few eyes. Today, at age 76, Gordon Cooper reflects upon his experiences. This universe is limitless and tremendous big universe, and we're kind of vain to think that we're the only ones that exist here. I think it's extraordinary if a man of that caliber is uh, uh, publicly coming forward. Uh, perhaps there is a sort of process of public acclamation going on, getting us used to the notion. There, I think we'll find that there are probably hundreds of other planets that are habitated and that there are all levels of civilization. Some maybe at the same level we are, others that may be thousands and millions of years ahead of us in development. In the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Richard Dreyfuss's character becomes obsessed with making contact with aliens. In a rare interview from the set, a young Steven Spielberg, Richard Dreyfuss, and government UFO researcher Dr. J. Allen Hynek explain the terminology of close encounters. Well, a close encounter of the first kind is one that is close, but nothing really happens. A close encounter of the first kind is visible contact with a UFO. Forget the shape and forget how fast it's going. It's something that you just can't explain. Close encounters of the second kind are those which leave a physical trace. Holes in the ground. Burn rings. Broken tree branches. Telephone lines down. Animals disturbed. Stopping of car engines. And the close encounters of the third kind are the most interesting of all. Close encounter of the third kind is really when you meet them. Contact with alien life forms have been largely discounted because of the lack of any credible proof. While video and photographs warrant serious analysis, no one has ever come forward with hard scientific proof of alien encounters until now. For the first time in history, one man is coming forward with tangible evidence that he claims is proof of an alien intelligence visiting Earth. 
Dr. Roger Lear is a surgeon from Southern California who has been performing operations on patients for over 30 years. Uh, so far, eight surgeries uh, have been uh, performed, and uh, with the eight surgeries, we have removed nine objects. The uh, commonality, of course, is that the, all the individuals are subjects of the alien abduction phenomena. In 1996, he performed one of the first surgeries to remove an alien implant from the jaw of an alleged abductee. The uh, gentleman uh, that we did the surgery on uh, for the, the procedure to remove an object uh, from the left jaw was in uh, private industry and uh, he had a history of uh, alien abduction. As with most abductees, the patient was reluctant to come forward or to have his face publicly shown. There is a certain stigma involved uh, with abductees. They have uh, innate fear about uh, telling somebody about what happened. They may feel that they may lose their job or their career may be in jeopardy, even financial loss. Uh, so there are some very practical things involved. What you are about to see is the actual video of the first implant being removed. We must warn you, this footage is not for the faint of heart. First, the surgeon administers local anesthesia by injection to deaden the area around the implant. Once the surgeon makes his initial incision into the tissue, surgical clamps are applied to keep the wound open. Then, the surgeon deepens the incision, and an X-ray instrument called a fluoroscan is brought in to locate the implant under the skin. Once the implant is located, a probe is inserted, and the implant is finally removed. Dr. Lear describes some of the extraordinary findings discovered during this amazing surgery. There is no portal of entry. There's no evidence how the object got inside the body. Then when we look at the soft tissues that surround the object, we find there is no inflammatory response. This is impossible because anything that enters the body should have an inflammatory response. And then thirdly, they are uh, surrounded by a large number of nerve proprioceptors which are not anatomically correct. Once the outer biological membrane was removed, it revealed a triangular-shaped object. This object was housed in yet another gray membrane. Remarkably, this inner membrane could not be cut even with a surgical scalpel. The implant was then sent to Los Alamos National Laboratory for metallurgic testing. Uh, we knew that when we got the initial report back from Los Alamos that we didn't have something that was common because Los Alamos is a world-class laboratory and would not recommend further testing on anything that they didn't feel was strange. So it was the combination of elements uh, that were in these objects that I think inspired them to advise us that more tests should be done. The implants were then sent to New Mexico Tech Laboratory where a battery of metallurgic tests were performed on the objects. The theory that they put forth was that these were portions of meteorites. They did not know they were removed from the human body. Amazingly, the New Mexico Tech Lab report revealed that the elements in the implants were composed of meteorites so rare, only a few had ever been found. At this point, Scanning electron microscope analysis was conducted on the implants. The results revealed the implants were manufactured and not naturally occurring meteorites. Amazingly, results showed the implants had been connected to the patient's nerve endings. The second uh, set of uh, tests following uh, some of the tests that were run at uh, New Mexico was run by the University of California at San Diego. The laboratory results from the University of California at San Diego confirmed the earlier tests. Astonishingly, a portion of the metal analyzed in the implants was extraterrestrial and did not come from Earth. Some of the elements that were found in combination were of non-terrestrial or extraterrestrial origin. The evidence is overwhelming. The implications are staggering. In each case, the chain of evidence has been documented, and the test results are shocking. This could be the proof that science has been looking for. The implications of this discovery are worldwide and affect every single living human being. But implants aren't the only extraterrestrial material Dr. Lear has been researching. 
The greatest discovery of all is yet to come. In the classic film War of the Worlds, a flying saucer crash lands in the remote countryside. The military quickly converges on the crash site to investigate. Could this happen in real life? According to some, it already has. The Roswell incident is unique among all of the historical UFO incidents because it's the one time that the U.S. military formally announced that they had captured a crashed flying saucer. In 1947, the military issued a press release confirming the recovery of a crashed UFO. News of the incident traveled around the world, but the very next day, the military said what crashed was actually a weather balloon. The July 1947 Roswell story is probably the most prominent in this phenomena of clear cover-up. The weather balloon story today is not acceptable. People who were there have said that it was a lie. The highly publicized Roswell case has sparked an avalanche of controversy. Today, all that remains is speculation and the official military denial. Two flying saucers had a mid-air collision. One kind of exploded and fell on the Brazel Ranch, 85 miles northwest of Roswell. The other one made it down sort of to the plains of San Augustine. A witness says there was a gash in the side that looked like two parentheses face to face, which sounds like two saucers hitting each other like this. All the residents of Roswell now today, they don't even want to think about it anymore. It's just like over saturated with this, you know? After a while, you just get burned out on it. But uh, everybody knew something went down. It's just we can't prove it. We go back to, OK, where's the evidence? What you are looking at may be one of the most significant discoveries of our time. According to several scientists, it is an actual piece of the Roswell craft. The uh, Roswell material originally came from a, a gentleman who was alleged to have been at the Roswell crash site. This material has been kept secret for over 50 years and is now being shown to the public for the first time. The Roswell piece uh, with, has a very interesting physical properties. Uh, if you hold it and you just lower a small portion of it into cold liquid, such as ice water, the uh, piece uh, that you're holding onto will get so cold, it'll start to burn your fingers and you have to drop it. The, uh, the opposite is also true. If you just uh, lower the piece into uh, a, a liquid, which is the temperature of tea water, it becomes so hot that you can't hold it and you have to drop it. Some of the tests that were run on the Roswell piece uh, showed that it was not only manufactured, but subjected to tremendously high heat, hotter than that of the heat produced by the sun and very possibly in a hydrogen atmosphere. Independent laboratories conducted a multitude of tests on the Roswell material. The tests were performed to determine the atomic composition and planetary origin. The uh, final results uh, were obtained from the uh, University of California at San Diego. Astonishingly, all of the elements in the Roswell material were extraterrestrial and could not have come from Earth. When I saw that the results showed that the extraterrestrial isotopic ratios were of the abundance that they were in this piece, I was uh, absolutely flabbergasted. All of the Roswell piece was extraterrestrial in nature. Once and for all, we have physical evidence that shows that we have been visited by extraterrestrial beings. Over 60% of the population believes aliens exist. I, I would be very sad if I thought there was no one out there but ourselves. But not everyone agrees. I mean, if I was asked, do you believe in aliens, I would say no. Do you believe in the possibility of it, I would say yes. Yet one out of every 12 people believes they've had a close encounter with a UFO. But no one has claimed to ever have first-hand experience with extraterrestrial craft until now. Bob Lazar is a former government scientist who claims he was hired by the military to back engineer the propulsion system of an extraterrestrial craft. In what may be one of the most revealing interviews ever filmed, Lazar candidly discusses his classified work at the top secret research facility, S4. I was hired 
uh, to replace one of a couple people that were killed uh, while working on one of the reactors from one of the crafts. Apparently they, for whatever reason, cut open an operating reactor and the device exploded, killing both of them. The S-4 facility is an area just off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed. It consists of nine hangars. The hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I think it was the third time I was up there. Upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sighting. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years, and you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And uh, it never even occurred to me, even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle, that you know, this wasn't man-made. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. It was a, a low performance test. The craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. It probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole as what we were doing, the fact that we weren't building this thing. We were trying to find out how it was made. We were back engineering it. As early as the 1950s, the government publicly acknowledged they were researching the UFO phenomenon in order to gain a technological advantage. A squad of 20 fully equipped Marines board the flying saucer. A preview of what may be the all-purpose vehicle of the future. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking and I gave it the name the sport model. Um, there was one that looked like a jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Extraterrestrial craft like the ones Lazar witnessed at S4 have been filmed and photographed around the world. In 1991, this footage made worldwide headlines. These two discs were videotaped in a suburb outside Ottawa, Canada. Both UFOs landed in a vacant field across from the photographer's house. This videotape became known as the Guardian footage. Again in 1991, screaming eyewitnesses prompted a tourist to take this picture from Manhattan Island in New York. The disc emerged from the river and quickly flew off. Another craft was photographed rising out of the water in Australia. Before it flew away, it docked with a smaller, dark UFO. A similar dark object was photographed in Denver. Startled eyewitnesses snapped this picture from a neighbor's backyard. In Peru, a hiker took this photograph of two discs as they hovered overhead for several minutes. Lazar's classified work at S-4 allowed him to closely study the extraterrestrial craft. I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower, uh, the lower level, essentially. And there were three large gravity amplifiers. These devices looked like about a two-foot diameter, four-foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above, and they can be independently positioned and that's what, what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward. The crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity, two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill. And the craft rolls downhill for infinity. It's always chasing a little distortion. Unidentified craft have been filmed and photographed flying around the world in radically different positions. Lazar explains. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. 
Lazar helps explain why UFOs have been videotaped, flying in seemingly erratic patterns. Moving around the source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference, essentially. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed. The gravity field around the Earth is not completely constant and stable, depending on the minerals and density of the Earth underneath it. The gravity will vary somewhat, and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is, is kind of unstable for the most part. In 1978, this UFO footage was taken by a New Zealand film crew. When the footage was enhanced, the craft appeared to have two portals and a rim around the center. The object was moving at such high speed, it left this track on a single frame of film. Photographic analysis revealed the craft was moving at 6,000 miles per hour. No conventional aircraft can maneuver at this speed. Just because you can visually see, either with the eye or on radar, a craft moving at 7,000 miles an hour and making a 90 degree turn, doesn't mean that's what's happening. Don't forget, again, that the craft is distorting space and time. So your eyes are fooling you. I mean, the craft does not necessarily have to be moving like that. People wonder how a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed, a 90 degree turn, when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect. Well, that, that really wouldn't happen. Inertia would have no effect. Uh, you're, you're in a distortion. And don't forget that gravity distorts time and space. So really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there. One thing most close encounters have in common is light. UFO sightings usually appear as lights in the sky, or the craft appears to glow. Lazar explains this aspect of the phenomenon. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. It's a, really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light, the same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. The most common UFO sightings are of a disc or saucer-shaped craft. But not all UFOs fit this description. Different sizes and variations of craft have been photographed and filmed around the world. These craft are often referred to as probes. Uh, they seem to appear and hover for hours uh, to several days at a time. They don't have a wide range of movement, but they seem to wobble or spin. And very often people have seen them hanging for hours and hours just observing. This probe-shaped UFO was videotaped in Las Vegas in 1991. In the early morning hours, an unsuspecting cameraman looked out his window and witnessed this probe hovering over a neighbor's house. It remained for several hours. Again in 1991, another probe was videotaped in the Las Vegas area. This probe hovered over an industrial park for several hours while a crowd gathered to watch the craft. The very next day, the same cameraman was shocked to see the probe had returned. On this day, it was monitoring the power line several hundred yards to the west. This particular probe was shot in Gulf Breeze, Florida in 1993. I think the most interesting thing about this probe is the distinction in detail that you can see very clearly. But again, you can see the slight rotation of the craft. You can clearly see the silver highs and lows. The cameraman, who wishes to remain anonymous, was camping overnight with a friend. When they awoke, 
This probe was observing their campsite. Both eyewitnesses said this probe was completely silent as it hovered over the water. At times, the craft approached the shore, but kept its distance from the campers. Both eyewitnesses said they experienced an eerie feeling, as if they were being watched. You can clearly see the, uh, the dynamic change in color, and at the top, there seems to be some grating right there at the top. As it slowly spins around, you can see some of the details on the craft as it kind of bobs in the air. This one here is, is one of the most detailed probe shots I've ever seen. The probe continued to observe the campsite for about half an hour until it slowly moved out to sea. The United States isn't the only country where probes have been sighted. Like most typical saucer-shaped UFOs, probes have been videotaped and photographed in almost every country around the globe. This very similar object was uh, shot in uh, Kobe, Japan in 1973. It's not streaking across the sky, it's just kind of hanging up there. This shot was taken in London, outside of London, in 95, uh, near a freeway bridge. Uh, you can see the craft very clearly hovering alongside the bridge. as it approaches an open parking lot. See the lights of the parking lot. In this next sequence, you see the craft come to a landing in the parking lot. You can see the two lights of the parking lot. There's the craft. Now, what's very striking is after this craft lands, you can see it coming down here, and it has released a probe that seems to be making its way toward the road. You can see the cars moving in the distance. You can see very slow movement. Now you can see the uh, original craft that came into the picture is now uh, rising above the road and seems to be leaving the uh, scene, leaving the uh, probe behind. As the probe slowly moved away, it passed over the freeway below. This dramatic footage has become known as the London Landing. Never before in history has a probe been caught on tape being released from a flying saucer. This is truly an extraordinary sighting. In Henderson, Nevada, we see another probe-shaped UFO that was videotaped at dusk. In 1990, we see yet another probe that was videotaped in Las Vegas just after dark. This probe hovered in a residential district for nearly an hour as the cameraman captured this dramatic footage. In what may be one of the lengthiest close encounters ever recorded, a probe hovered over a neighborhood for three consecutive days. The local residents described this probe as completely silent, not making a sound as it hovered in the sky. Eyewitness accounts described the probe as having a searchlight that would turn on and off throughout the three-day sighting. It took two days of repeated calls from the local residents to the sheriff's office before a deputy was sent to investigate. To this day, no record of the sighting is on file with the sheriff's office. Now this is a very striking probe shot. You can see the probe slowly descend down to the water and it seems to just hover right above the surface. You don't see any movement on the water. The craft is clearly right above. You can see a slight shadow down here. And then the craft slowly kind of rises up and uh, departs the scene. Since the 1940s, Hollywood has portrayed the typical alien craft as a disc or flying saucer. But not all UFOs look like the classic disc-shaped craft or cylindrical probe. UFOs have been photographed in all shapes, sizes, and colors. However, a large majority of sightings fall into this last category. UFOs, as we can see, come in many different sizes and shapes. Obviously, the classic round saucer shape uh, is the most known. Uh, but we also have uh, what they're, are called cigar-shaped ships. Uh, they seem to be long, cylindrical. This shot here is a cigar-shaped uh, craft uh, filmed in Germany, Hagen, Germany, uh, I believe in 1983. This similar cigar-shaped UFO was also photographed in the skies over Hagen, Germany. The footage was taken in 1980. Even an airliner has had a close encounter with a cigar-shaped UFO. Retired airline pilot Guy Kirkwood describes what happened to the crew and passengers 
aboard Flight 182. A scheduled flight from Los Angeles to New Orleans, about uh, 30 miles out of Albuquerque Center and uh, 31,000 feet in a Boeing 720B. We had one right alongside of us for about eight minutes. Members of the crew and even a number of passengers were able to take photographs of the object. It looks like a rifle barrel, and it was larger than the Boeing. A terrified stewardess asked Captain Kirkwood what to tell the passengers. He simply replied, Tell them they're looking at the same thing we're looking at. We, we refer to these things as undesirable flying objects. They're, they're, they're not fun. There's, there's no joy in it. Uh, and especially when you're responsible, in this case, for, for 176 lives. Cigar-shaped crafts were first sighted in Nuremberg, Germany in 1561. In 1990, crowds gathered in Krasnodar, Russia, to watch this cigar-shaped UFO as it hovered over the city for several hours. Another cigar-shaped UFO was filmed in Rhode Island in 1967. This shot taken by George Adamski in 1952 clearly shows the larger ship with many smaller ships hovering about it. It's uh, very unique to note the dark, shadowy effect of the larger ship and the very luminescent, bright uh, color coming off the smaller ships. Recently released uh, film clips from NASA have revealed very, very unusual objects that have been filmed and photographed over the years. NASA's official policy is that it is not engaged in any UFO research. But NASA's own footage vaults reveal that practically all of the early Gemini and Apollo missions encountered UFOs. In 1985, NASA released UFO footage taken by their astronauts in lunar and terrestrial orbit. This particular shot right here shows a small uh, ball-like uh, silver object racing above the surface of the moon, clearly seen through the window of the Apollo Lunar uh, Command Module. This film was taken by astronaut James McDivitt aboard Gemini 4. One day before the historical landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 crew filmed this luminous disk flying around the lunar surface with great speed. This craft here was photographed in stationary o orbit. You can see the moon's surface, and the craft just seems to be hanging there. In this photograph here, you can see as we zoom in on it, uh, a lot of detail on what appeared to be two ships landed on the lunar surface. Despite NASA's official position, many astronauts have spoken privately about their close encounters. James Lovell, Deke Slayton, James McDivitt, Wally Sarah, and others have reportedly had contact with UFOs. Unfortunately, when you say astronauts have had contact, people think you're, you're having it in, in space. <clears throat> in space, to my knowledge, McDivitt was the only one that could be even a possibly an unidentified object. This is actually a NASA photograph uh, taken by James McDivitt on an early Apollo mission. Uh, this is the surface of the moon, and they observed this unusual lighted object in the sky and snapped off a couple of shots. In March 1989, Lift the crew off. of the space shuttle Discovery may have had their own close encounter. A ham radio operator reportedly picked up the voice of shuttle pilot Colonel James Block, speaking on a secret NASA channel. Uh, Houston, uh, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft uh, under observance. NASA has denied that this is Colonel Blaha's voice. Another space shuttle mission filmed several disks in high altitude orbit, traveling at several thousand miles per hour. Shortly thereafter, NASA began scrambling all shuttle transmissions. In the mid-1970s, NASA launched the Viking probe. Its mission was to map the surface of Mars. There was a scientist standing at jet, the Jet Propulsion Lab back in the mid-1970s when these images started coming back from an orbiter that we had around Mars, Viking. And he yelled out loud, my God, what is that? And here was this face. 
and what people perceive to be a face. Vikings camera sent back these pictures of what appears to be a face on the Martian surface. Photographic examination has revealed the face is over 1,500 feet tall and over a mile in length. When others who became interested in that face started looking at other orbital passes and looking at some frames in which there was the face and what's around it. If there's something that appears to actually be possibly an artificial face and it's that huge, well, maybe there is something around it that would suggest ancient civilization, building something. Well, when they started looking at these frames, they found a cluster of what does appear to be pyramids. Vikings sent back these pictures of unexplainable structures from the Sidonian region of the planet. Viking photographed these structures in great detail. NASA quickly responded to the public's claims that they had discovered proof of an alien civilization. The official explanation for the structures was that the pictures contained missing data and Vikings cameras could not transmit the remaining information. Despite the photographic evidence released from NASA's own files, the official position is that these encounters are nothing more than space debris, solar flares, or celestial anomalies. Through the years, Hollywood has fueled our imagination with alien encounters. Movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Aliens have captivated modern audiences. While the classics like War of the Worlds this island Earth and Earth versus the Flying Saucers have entertained generations of moviegoers. But has there ever been a time when science fiction has blurred the lines of reality? I ended up in one of several off-the-record conversations with um, an alleged uh, government agent. And he said, this may or may not surprise you, but he said, do you remember that feature film back in the early 50s called The Day the Earth Stood Still. There was a robot, and there was a humanoid, and there was a silver disc, and the robot and the humanoid were able to bring down entire electrical systems with a technology that was beyond the understanding of our military and our government. And that was what the story was about. And the humanoid was basically saying to the government that you need to take better care of your environment and there are various things that you need to do. I came here to give you these facts. But if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. He said that was our government's first test of public reaction. Well, nobody ran out into the streets screaming. In fact, the day the earth stood still has become a classic film. People love to see that film. Robert Wise, director of The Day the Earth Stood Still, recalls the movie. What I loved about this was the fact that it was laid all in Washington, D.C. in our capital, so it was really you know, kind of mundane, down to earth, very real. And uh, I, thought it, I thought it had a, a great a sense of reality and believability, credibility to it. This was one of the government's ways of getting a population exposed to concepts that might be very difficult get everyone really past a point of fear about something new and unknown. The hidden story has been coming out, let's say, in dribs and drabs over uh, the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Yes, the full story hasn't been told, uh, but I think we're getting a lot of uh, hints of what it might be. The story has been slowly leaked to the public. Uh, in essence, to get them ready for the inevitable truth. But today, with all the evidence, the footage, the photographs, and now scientific proof, is mankind ready for perhaps the ultimate truth? I think man on Earth here is pretty much ready to, uh, to receive man from somewhere else.